Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings and we thank you for your mercy. And we just thank you, Lord, for all the words that we have received today. Let it go to our hearts and so that you can have the light and shine out on the, from us and, and give you all the glory. And we just uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for your what you do in our lives. And uh, we just ask for you to uh, watch over us and keep us uh, in your light, Lord. And thank you, Jesus. And uh, praise and worship. And amen. 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 fields where daylight travels I want to yield despite despair of tears when will you when will you be returning I cast my lot beyond the view across these fields I take my pleasure, force of your will, no matter what may come. Through the mist, i found the treasure, worth my life, kingdom soon to come. Face to face, no more alone. I shall know as I am known and with you I am alive Lord with you I am satisfied across these fields beyond the stars above this pale endless universe of ours where dreams were born all mysteries unfold where love is a person to behold across these fields beyond the stars above this pale endless universe of ours where dreams were born, all mysteries unfold, where love is a person to behold. Across these fields, where daylight travels, ooh, 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 ooh.
in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes to the hillside where justice and mercy embrace. There the Son of God gave his life for us and our measureless debt was erased Jesus to you we lift our eyes Jesus our glory and our prize we adore you behold you our Savior ever true oh Jesus we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the morning and see Christ the lion away. What a glorious dawn fear of death is gone, for we carry his life in our veins. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout. All glory to Jesus alone. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. our glory and our prize we adore you behold you our savior ever true oh jesus we turn our eyes to you oh jesus we turn our eyes to you of the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one trust your son drink the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin jesus thank you father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table jesus thank you Thank you. 
perfect sacrifice I've been brought near enemy you made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no end your blood has washed away my sin Jesus thank you Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus thank you your blood has washed away my sin Jesus thank you Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus thank you lover of my soul I want to live for you lover of Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Your blood washed away my sin Jesus thank you Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you If you have your Bibles, open with me to Acts 17, verse 30. We are going to be looking around tonight uh, throughout Scripture. But we're going to look at the command that God gives every human being to repent and to believe. And uh, the difficulties here of uh, the command of God to repent and believe, it's, it's a good thing that God commands us to do all human beings actually, but when you try to do it, you discover that you might lack within yourself the power to be able to bring it to pass. And that's why scripture said it's by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So clearly the Ephesians 2 Verse 8 and 9 passage tells us where faith really comes from. It, it comes from God. But it's something that you and I are commanded to seek and commanded to do. And um, we'll go here to Acts 17 verse 30. First of all, and looking at repentance and faith, as the two responsibilities that you and I are called to do. Repent and believe. And without us repenting, without us believing, there is no access into God's salvation. Uh, these are the keys, if you will, that bring us into the kingdom. Some of the keys that give us access to the kingdom of God, repentance and believing. But I think it's important that we hear the gospel first, right? I mean, you can't truly repent and you can't really know what you're supposed to repent of unless you hear the gospel preached correctly, right? And you don't know what or who you're supposed to believe in unless Christ is presented to you for the opportunity to believe in him. 
So that's important. And so what I will say is, is the power of the gospel um, and the clarity of the gospel ought to produce in us a, uh, a need and an awareness that we do need to repent and believe. And if, those, um, if that calling isn't placed upon us, then we're not really hearing the gospel. Because when we hear the gospel correctly, we realize that, yes, we are called to repent. And we are called to believe. And that's a command from God. So Acts 17, verse 30, uh, notice it said, The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So according to this verse, who does he command to repent? All people. Everybody. Now is everyone going to repent? No. no. But that doesn't change the command. He still commands everyone to repent. And that is a command that should always be inclusive to everyone in the gospel message. It's a message of reconciliation. It's a message of opportunity to get right with God and uh, to admit your need for God. And so he commands men and women everywhere to repent. That's a command. It's not an option. And Paul is preaching this to people who had never heard the gospel of Christ. And he's commanding them to repent. Which is a response that we must do to the hearing of the gospel message. Now Mark 1 verse 15, let's, let's go there. Mark 1 verse 15, Jesus himself, after John was put in prison, he preached this to the multitudes. <clears throat> and notice there's a timing involved that now Christ has come the gospel is proclaimed clearly with clarity now we're going to talk about this because the Bible commands all people everywhere to repent and the Bible commands all people everywhere to believe and yet we have the problem of lacking the ability to do that within ourselves. It's not a work that we can perform apart from God's grace. So we should seek it. And I do believe when we talk about preaching the gospel, there's a very important activity of the Holy Spirit that is often overlooked. And it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There is a prior working of the Spirit prior to regeneration. It's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that must be done in order for regeneration to occur. In other words, God will begin to awaken a human being to their need of salvation before salvation occurs. That's a work of God's Holy Spirit too. But let's read this. It says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, that's a command again, and believe, that's another command. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's something we're commanded to do, by the way. You and I. We I have a footnote for believe. Go, go for it. Or put your trust in. Amen. And I think it's more accurate in what do you believe, in, in believe, because a lot of people say, well, just believe, right? Yes. Yeah. But it's actually trusting that Christ's sacrifice was enough to cover all of your sins. Amen. That he was who he said he was, that he died for your for you to cover your sins and regenerate you, um, yeah. it, it's that trust. That's the saving faith, is that trust, yeah. that it was enough. Because a lot of people, they'll take the word believe and yep. they'll mentally assent to the fact that Jesus is true yep. and that what he's saying is true, but it's not a saving faith because they haven't put their trust yeah. in him. And it's unfortunate the way we use the word believe today in our English terminology, because believing does mean, as you pointed out, to put your trust in Christ, to trust in, adhere to, to rely upon. Where now we have people that say, well, I believe in Jesus, but what they're really saying sometimes is, well, I mentally assent to the fact that Jesus is who he claims to be, but they still don't put their trust in him, so therefore it's not a saving faith. 
it has to be a saving faith to trust. Well, not an analogy just to agree. that I really enjoy that kind of gives you a good visual picture is you're on an airplane with, with a parachute. Yeah. And the plane's going to crash. Do you just put it under your seat? I believe it'll save me, so I'll put it under my seat. Or do you trust in it? You put it on, right? There's a difference there. Amen. Amen to that. So repent and believe in the gospel. Put your trust in Christ. Now, the problem we have is the state of human beings. That's the issue that we have. But here's a point. We should never allow the state of human beings to affect how we preach this. We are called to, to preach repentance to every human being. We are called through the gospel to command all people everywhere to repent. We are also commanded in scripture to command all people to believe, to put their trust in Christ. Just because a person might lack the ability to be able to perform it doesn't mean that we shouldn't preach it. It's the same as, for example, the, the Ten Commandments is still a moral standard of God. Just because <coughs> human beings can't keep that moral standard, it doesn't mean, well, away with the commandments because people can't do it, right? Um, really what the Bible does, it exposes our need for grace. It exposes our need for God. So when you hear the gospel message and you see within yourself where you are being commanded to repent and believe, if you lack that power, you start seeking God for the true repentance that he's commanding you to do and the true saving faith that he's commanding you to have. And so that's all right, because it is still by grace, right, that we've been saved. And these are gifts from God. Now, I, I do have a few quotations interspersed throughout all of this, and I'm going to um, be reiterating. One is from John Flavel, who was a Puritan. He says, um, but you will say, if unregenerate men be dead men, do we agree that all men... Apart from Christ, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Yep, scripture says it. The Bible says it. Do you remember where it says it? What verse? Um, Ephesians 2, right? Yeah, verse Ephesians 1. 2, but it's also in... Um, we have been... We're dead in our... 1 John? Yeah. But Ephesians 2, verse 1 says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And so if we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we acknowledge the fact that without God's grace, we wouldn't be able to respond to God in a correct way. But that doesn't nullify the command to repent and to believe. So he's saying here, but you will say, if unregenerate men be dead men, to what purpose is it to persuade them to arise and stand up? This difficulty is solved in this very text, and we'll look at this in a moment, Ephesians 5:14. Uh, though the duty is ours, yet the power is God's. Isn't that wonderful? John Flavel. So the duty remains ours to repent and to believe. And by the way, that's not just a one-time thing. Uh, um, repentance is a daily occurrence in the life of the believer, is it not? Yes. And, and as long as we're changing and being changed, that we will always be repenting. There's, there's a foundational repentance that's not done again, which is an aspect of your salvation, and we don't lay again that foundation of repentance from dead works, but now we are called to live a life of repentance. You, you'll never outgrow repentance till you see Jesus face to face. But the repentance now for the believer is an aspect of our transformation. So there's that one-time repentance that brings you into salvation, which is foundational, for your Christianity, it's foundational for your new birth. And there is a one-time saving faith that seals you with salvation. But we're still called to believe. We're still called to repent. Those foundations have been laid, and we don't have to go back and relay it over and over and over again. There are churches out there that preach that even though you got saved last week, you have to get saved again next week, you know, because maybe you had a bad week. But that's not the Christianity of the Bible. And that will just keep you in, um, in eternal doubt and, um, you know, eternal insecurity. So this is a great quote by John Flavel. The duty is ours, yet the power is God's. 
Now, Ephesians 5.14 is the verse that he quoted here. And I do believe this is in reference to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let's not forget that prior to regeneration, however long that convicting work might be, it, it varies for each individual, the Holy Spirit will convict before he regenerates. He will show you your need of salvation, your need for repentance, your need to have faith. And he'll show you that void in your life. And it's different for every person. So I don't want to say it has to be exactly this way for each individual. But nevertheless, there will be a work of conviction that goes on in your life. And that's from the Holy Spirit. Let's not forget that. And sometimes that does get forgotten before regeneration. Now it says here, uh, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says... Awake, O sleeper. So this is a call for the person that's been asleep in their state of sin and arise from the dead. That's a call from God, is it not? And Christ will shine on you. Now, I want to show you, though, that the conviction of sin isn't just for believers. It's for unbelievers as well. Just because a person is convicted doesn't necessarily mean that they will get saved. Do you realize that? Mm -hmm. A person can be convicted and still never come to a point of salvation. That makes them doubly guilty, by the way, because they've been made aware of their condition, of their need of Christ, their and they refuse him. What's that? Their conscious rejection. Yes. Yeah. Amen. And that's the... That's why it's important to preach the gospel, because what that does, it gives people an opportunity to receive Christ. But if they don't receive him, then it doesn't mean they haven't had opportunity to do so. And that's why God has set this whole preaching of the gospel up that whoever, you know, we preach to whoever. Now, what we have discovered is in the gospel message, there's an effectual call that human beings are not in control of. We preach, only God gives the effective call. In other words, only God knows who the elect really are. I don't. You know, the secret things belong to the Lord, but what's been revealed belongs to us. We've been called to preach whoever. We preach with the same strength, the same force that all men everywhere are commanded to repent and believe the gospel. But it's God and God alone who effectually calls particular human beings. He's in charge of that. Not you, not me. I'm not in charge of that. <clears throat> it's a good thing because um, that way God, you know, he saves people you don't expect, right? I mean, he does. He brings people to himself that you have no idea. I mean, if we were in charge of that, we might be predetermining, well, I want this type of person to come to Christ, but not that type. Where, the, you know, Jesus said the gospel, yeah, the gospel is a net that brings in many types of fish. You know, some good, some bad, and some are thrown out. We understand that. But it's God who determines who gets the effective call. Not me, not you. But we are still to preach with the same effect to every human being with the same command, the same force from Scripture. Let's go to John 16, verse 8. This is something we need to be reminded of in the preaching of the gospel, that even though there may be people in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and Green River, and then the whole Sweetwater County, that hear the gospel, that never get saved, that doesn't mean we're still not called to preach to them. We are. We're not in this like a salesman where we locate the places that are going to receive, you know. We don't have that kind of luxury as Christians. We're called to preach wherever, we're, wherever God sends us, which means that um, a friend of mine, when we were out evangelizing, every person who we, who we offered to track to and we offered, uh, you know, to talk to, they all turned it down. And he said, this is probably a briar patch we're on right now, <laughs> you know. But it's like, well, then, do you realize that God will sometimes send you to the briar patch? In the hope that, you know, there could be someone hiding out in that briar patch. 
that could be one of those who God has known from before the foundations of the earth. We don't know. That's his business. But notice this, that the coming of the Holy Spirit will produce this. And it's not just talking about believers here. It's talking about the whole world. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict who? The world. The world. Not all the world are believers. Nor will they ever be so. But the Spirit's coming will convict the world. Now, the word convict, what do you get out of that? When the Spirit convicts. If you're convicted of something, what does it mean? It means you're guilty. You're guilty, amen. Was that what you were going to say? Uh, to bring clarity of what you're guilty of. Amen. And why so? I like that. Very good. Very good, Noah. Yeah, I enjoy that. that it brings like a, a, a clearness. A contrast. Between well, when you're, when you're brought mm -hmm. forth before a judge, right? Yeah. They bring up the charges. That's a good and point. And they bring the evidence. Yeah. And they find you guilty. Then at that point, you are officially convicted. At Amen. That point. That's a good point. Definitely. And it's in a legal sense, but there's a sense of being convinced as well. Yeah. Thank you. It can be translated convinced. Yep, that's true. That's a good point, John. Yeah. Three, and I can't remember the third part of the yeah. Convince is a good thing. Um, reprove is another one. It can also be translated reprove. He will reprove the world of sin. Just because we're under conviction doesn't mean that we will get saved. And I think that's important for us to point that out. The, um, Jesus said, This gospel shall be preached in all the world to every nation as a witness to every nation. And then shall the end come. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin. We really do need to know what sin really is. And uh, sin is against God, isn't it? It's breaking his commands. It's, it's, it's always against God, ultimately. And um, when we begin to recognize that sin is all the breaking of God's commands then we start to realize what sin really is and the difficulty we have and our need for forgiveness. So he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness, the righteousness of God. Um, God has proved himself to be righteous by the giving up of his only son. God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son. That's the message of the gospel, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in a nutshell. So there is a righteousness of God. Any righteousness that the gospel provides. When you're convicted concerning righteousness, you're convicted of your lack of it, that you don't have it. You're measured by the standard of Christ, and you realize you don't measure up. But he gives a righteousness tonight that we don't have. So he convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. There is a future judgment to come. And the only way that a human being will become persuaded of that reality is to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. How many of you have ever met people who knew they were going to hell and even told you they were going to hell, but they still did not want to receive Christ? Anybody ever meet anyone like that? Yeah, every one of us. Plenty, plenty, plenty. So we could say that the Holy Spirit has convicted them of the reality of a judgment to come, which makes them even more guilty, but they still reject the salvation, which makes them even more guilty because now they know they need Christ. Now they know there is a judgment to come, but they're not doing anything about it to prepare for that judgment that is coming. Now notice that our Lord elaborates a little more. He says, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Now concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, I believe it's how Butch shared it. They do not trust in me. They do not put their faith in me. They do not rely on me. And that won't save you. If It's not a saving faith. They, they don't believe in who I am. There's many people today who regard Jesus as a great man, a great prophet, 
or even the first created. And so in that sense, they do not believe in me. They don't believe in who I am. They reject who I am. And there's many religions that fall into that category. And all their religion is worthless because they do not believe in him. They will be eternally damned if they don't put their trust in Christ. Jesus put it this way, unless you believe I am, you will perish in your sins. And it's true. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, that's been clarified, that's been done. There's an empty tomb, an occupied throne. Jesus has been raised from the dead. The evidence is there. It's, it's all out in front of us. And the righteousness of God in how he's fulfilled his own word, he has declared himself righteous in every respect, in the fulfillment of the prophecies, the fulfillment of the promises, in raising his only son from the dead and his only son ascending to go back to the Father. He has, he has made every provision. He says, and you will see me no longer uh, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world is Satan. Now you might ask yourself the question, why is Satan still having a field day then if, uh, you know, if he's been judged? Well, he has been judged. He's on borrowed time. The Bible says he has great wrath knowing that his time is short. And so he's going to try to cause as much chaos on planet Earth as he's allowed to cause. And God permits him a certain amount there by his sovereignty. The devil is not a free devil running around doing what he wants. He's limited. He has a short time. That speaks of limitation. And he knows that his judgment is coming, and he will be judged. The Bible clearly tells us that he will end up being thrown into the lake of fire at the end of the millennial age. He'll be thrown into the lake of fire. He knows it. The, the Bible says it. Even the demons believe and tremble, right? It's not a saving faith, but they believe the Scripture. They know the power of God. They're the ones who came up with atheism and all that even though they themselves do believe in God, because they've seen him. Now, to give you a quotation here. The sinner's inability to obey God does not nullify his duty to do so. Bill Johnson, would you agree with that statement? Yep. Yes. Just because I lack the power to do what's right doesn't mean that the commandments no longer apply to me, Right? If the Bible says, I shall not bear false witness, and because of my failure to not to bear false witness, does that mean, does that make the commandment null and void because of my inability to keep it? No, it doesn't. That makes me a liar, by the way, and that makes me a blasphemer also. Um, but still, the commandment is in force. So when God commands the sinner to repent and believe, because the sinner lacks the ability to do so, does that make the command to repent and believe null and void? No. It's the right thing to do. All it does is it exposes my sin even more. And it also shows how righteous God is too. That's right. It exposes my need for God's grace. And so that when I do repent and when I do put my faith in Christ, I'm not using that as a reference for a self-righteous activity. It's something that I know that it was by grace, you know. Um, now, to repeat this, um, sin itself is a moral issue. And since sin is the cause of our inability, it is, as Jonathan Edwards said, a moral inability, not a natural one. So in other words, it's a moral issue. Our failure to repent and put our trust in Christ shows our moral condition. Our inability to do so does not nullify God's command to do what's necessary for salvation to occur. So what do you do in this situation? You seek God until he gives it. You know, you seek repentance, you seek faith, and you make this your primary seeking. And if God has convicted you, and God has awakened you to your need of this, this is something you will seek for until you find it. 
right? What are the promises of Jesus? Seek and you shall find. Ask and it, I'm giving it our sequence, but ask and it shall be given, right? Knock, and that's a continuous tense, by the way. Keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Amen? So, go ahead. I was going to say, when Jesus talked about when your eye caused you to sin, pluck it out and cast it away from you. Yeah. It's it's not a literal, but it, but that's the battle, right? That's how we should be fighting our sin yeah. to that extent. That's right? right. That's right. So the defect in man is his own fault. Can we say our sin is our own fault? Yep. Yeah. Our condition is our own fault? Yes. Not God's. No. Therefore, man's own inability is something he is guilty for. It just shows our true condition. And that inability cannot therefore be seen as something that relieves the sinner of responsibility. Just because I can't quit lying, for example, doesn't mean that thou shalt not bear false witness is no longer relevant. The command is still in force, right? God is good. God is righteous, even though I'm not. In fact, Scripture says, let God be true, but every man a liar. Now, but, it, but even though we can't do it, God made, gave us a way out, right? That's, that's he right. Provided, he provided. He's provided it. He provided the sacrifice for us. Yeah, he's shown the way. That we can't do it. There is one, isn't it 1 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, or 12 and 13? There has no temptation overtaking you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful who will with the temptation make a way of escape. We all hit that impasse in our own life sometimes where you're like, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, you know, and um, he's able to do that. But we'll the way of that. escape is, is Christ. That's right. Christ is our only refuge. Now, John Calvin says this. He's like, wow, you're quoting John Calvin? Yeah, I'll quote John Calvin. Why not? I'll, I'll quote a Frenchman. Why not? Um, he said, the mercy of God is offered equally to those who believe and to those who believe not. Do we believe that tonight? It's offered to all equally. So that those who are not divinely taught within are rendered inexcusable. So because it is offered equally to all, those who do not receive it, they are, they are without excuse. It's there, you know, and that was a Calvin quote. And so he gets a bad rap a lot of times, undeservedly so. Not that he's perfect, nor is there any teacher that's perfect. Now, so, so the next quote here, um, this is another Calvin quote. He says, a slight acquaintance with Paul will enable anyone to understand without tedious argument how easily he reconciled things which they pretend to be repugnant to each other. Christ commands men to believe in him. Yet his limitation is neither false nor contrary to his command when he says, No man can come to me except it were given him of my Father. And that's true. Let preaching, therefore, have its force to bring men to faith. So what he's saying is, we're called to preach to people everywhere to have faith in God, even though it is only God who can draw people. He's chosen means through which to draw people, and, and uh, preaching is one of those means. Now, to quote, this is mine, Luther now. The first part then of Christianity is the preaching of repentance. It's true. If you've been going to church for years, for example, and you've never heard a message of repentance, you're going to the wrong church. I must say, you are going to the wrong church. Let alone because a repentance is essential for salvation to occur. And if the preacher never brings up sin, then you're in a real pickle because then you are in a bad church. And the likelihood is this, if you're under a ministry that never preaches repentance, then you're under a ministry that never preaches on sin. And if there's no sin, and if there's no repentance, then there's no gospel. Simple as that. You cannot have a gospel without a need for good news to be given. And so uh, the first part then of Christianity is the preaching of repentance and the knowledge of ourselves. That's true. A man, therefore, is made a Christian, not by working, but by hearing. Amen? Amen. It's by hearing. 
Wherefore, he that will exercise himself to righteousness must first exercise himself in hearing the gospel. Because it's in the hearing that saves and transforms. Uh, now, when he has heard and received the gospel, let him give himself to God with a joyful heart, and afterwards let him exercise himself in those good works which are commanded in the law. So, even though the law cannot save, and we cannot do the law in our own power, with this newfound grace in our life, we fulfill the law through the power of God's Holy Spirit. So, in other words, any moral requirement that God requires of you and I as believers can only be fulfilled by grace and by the Holy Spirit working in our life. It's not something we can do on our own. Now, he's using, this is a quotation on the book of Galatians. If you turn with me to Galatians 3 and verse 2. Let's go there. So it's hearing that changes us. It's not working that changes us. It's hearing that changes us. Because it's by hearing that faith comes. And the faith that's necessary to be able to be changed comes by hearing. Not by working. And that's what Luther is saying here. And basically, Luther is agreeing with Paul, which is more important than what Luther has to say. Luther is right because he's quoting from Paul's standard of teaching. And, and Paul says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The only, thing, the only way that you and I can receive from God is by hearing with faith, not by works of the law. We don't work our way into this. We can't work our way into it. We get it by faith, and we get faith by hearing what God has to say. That's why we come under God's word. Now, he goes on to say, and verse 3 is really something that should convict us as Christians when he said, um, let me ask you only this. Do you receive the Spirit? Oh, I already gave that, didn't I? Um, are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? Well, we have to say yes. Yeah, sometimes we are. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Well, no, but we find ourselves trapped sometimes in that effort. And he said, did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? It's always by the hearing with faith, isn't it? That God performs the greatest miracle of all, which is the work of regeneration in the human heart. And it's by the hearing of faith that God transforms the sinner into a saint and makes him the very righteousness of God. It's the word of God implanted in your heart that brings the new birth. And when the word of God is implanted in your heart, you've heard the word of God. You've received the word of God. And you've received it as the word of God. And that's what changes your life. Not all these religious works that the church calls us to do, but we're required to hear with faith. We need to lay that aside. It's not by our works. It's by the hearing with faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him from faith. The Bible also says in Romans 14, 23, that whatsoever does not proceed from faith is sin. That includes our religious works. If it doesn't proceed from faith, then Augustine called it splendid sin. Still sin but it's splendid, and that's what's so deceiving about it. Now, we are aware of our conscious need of God, and I, w I used to listen to a certain faith preacher who said it's wrong to pray in this way, but I would disagree with him because the person who prayed this way was not rebuked by Jesus. He was granted the faith that he requested. Um, this is, um, let's see, Mark 9 24, and this, this word faith preacher said, oh, you, you shouldn't be praying this way because it's unbelief to pray this way. It's like, well, isn't that the point? 
Um, we need help with our own belief. It's not a sin for us to acknowledge that we need help with our own belief. It was a prayer that was answered, by the way, so it can't be a sinful request. It says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Well, he did, but he said, help my unbelief. Is that wrong to pray that way? No. He acknowledged his need, he, that he had a certain faith, but he had that sense where he needed more faith. And it's okay for you and I to admit that we need help. Help my unbelief. That was a cry that he answered, and he delivered the child as well. Pastor? Yes. Yeah. So he was repenting of his unbelief. Yeah. And unbelief in the eternal God. Yeah. He was repenting. He was repenting of that. I think what this man is saying is confirming what we're trying to communicate this evening, isn't it? It's like you come to that point of conviction, and you are seeking repentance. You acknowledge your need. That yes, God requires faith, and you might have it to a certain degree, but you're like, I need more, help me. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so, yeah, go for it. Well, many times, some of us are in a position where we believe God, we can believe that He heals, but will He heal me? Or yes. Will he heal, or listen to our prayer at that time, yeah. which is an unbelief. Yeah. And He may have been in that same position. Yeah. He knew he was the Messiah, but would he really help him? And he had dealt with his son for a long time. I, his son wasn't like a little, little child, and the apostles tried to cast it out and could not. And so he was at that point of absolute despair, really. And um, I would paraphrase that a little different. I would it. say, I trust you, help my unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. Sure which is the accurate way of dealing with that. Now, another quotation here, guys, and this is by John Owen. And the reason why I'm quoting all these different people is to show you that they're all in agreement here. They're not in a disagreement on this issue. So we are expressly commanded to believe, and that upon the highest promises. So God has granted us precious promises, and those promises are encouragements for us to believe. God has given us the gospel in the form of a promise, promises. All the promises of God in him are yea and amen unto the glory of God through us, uh, Paul said. So these promises are high promises, which really uh, are meant to drive us only one direction, to believe in what God has said, that encourages us. That's what God wants. It says, and under the greatest penalties, yes, there's penalties for not believing. And those are made clear alongside the promises too. In many places, penalties for not trusting in Christ. This command is that which makes believing formally a duty. Faith is a grace as it is freely wrought in us by the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. The root of all obedience and duties as it is radically fixed in the heart. But as it is commanded, it is a duty, and these commands, you know, are several ways expressed by invitations, exhortations, propositions, John Owen. The Bible's full of them. Amen. It's throughout Scripture. So God is calling for a response from you and me. And that response and that call remains as powerful and is effective, even though in and of ourselves we may not have the ability to do it, God is still commanding us to do it. And he will provide the grace as you seek him for it. And he did the same thing with, with the Jews in, in the Old Testament and other believers in, in the Old Testament. It Amen. didn't change. Amen. The format didn't change. He called them all to repent. Amen. Now, Thomas Brooks, who's another Puritan preacher, put it this way. He said, my counsel 
and this is in brackets, to his unsaved hearers, because they were unsaved hearers in the midst, is this. Stir up your souls to lay hold on the Lord Jesus and look up to him. Wait on him from whom every good and perfect gift comes and give him no rest till he have given thee that dual faith. Amen? So this is worth seeking for, isn't it? If we don't have salvation, if we don't have the jewel of faith, God has it, and we should seek him until he grants it. And that was Thomas Brooks. Now, um, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, gives us this marvelous balance. And these verses should always be quoted together, never separate. Um, if you, for example, sit under preaching that only ever quote to you verse 12, you might be in a legalistic church. And, uh, but it's important that we have verse 13. In fact, it's been my experience under preaching that I've sat under, they will never quote verse 13, but they'll always just give you verse 12. But it's important, and, and we won't even get into verse 14, John. That's one of your verses that um, only by grace can you fulfill that one, right? Uh, do all things without murmuring and complaining. When you've mastered that, come back to me, will you? Well, you probably wouldn't be here. But anyway, um, you'd be in glory with the Lord. <laughs> yeah. So verse 12. So therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if we stop there, that could be very easily misunderstood. You better get busy. You better find religious works to do here. But notice the next verse. What do we work out? We work out that which God has already put in us. That's the key. And he goes on to say this, though. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you. Or the word work is energizo, which is from which we get the word energy. It is God who energizes in you, both to will. So God even gives you the will, even if you didn't previously have it. He gives you the will. And it, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Isn't that good news? So God works in you that which you need to do. Now, that's all I have for this evening. I'm done. So this is a shorter message. He, and it even had an interval, so there can't be too much complaint. Um, any thoughts, any questions on what we've looked at tonight? Speak now or forever. Hold thy peace. I've got a note on the to will and to work. Yes. God energizes both the believer's desires and his actions. The Greek word for will indicates that he is not focusing on mere desires or whimsical emotions, yes. but on the studied intent to fulfill a planned purpose. Amen. God's power makes his church willing to live uh, godly lives. Amen. It kind of goes with Ephesians 2.10, doesn't it? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. My, my difficulty with Ephesians 2.10 is I wish the Lord would show me, like lay out the plan go. of the good works he's yeah. given to me in advance. Then I could make a list and say, I've done that one, done that one, done that one. Yeah. What else? And the Lord doesn't do that. And... Um, you know, those encounters that we don't expect, those different things that we may not even be aware of. He's given us works in advance for us to do without showing us always what those works are. And the works can only be manifested or done by faith. Amen. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. 
So when we do repent, and when we do put our trust in God, it is something we do, but it is something we give God the glory for, right? It's, it, it's a work, it's a good work that God has put within us. So working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, that, it, that, that, that involves repentance and faith. And of course, let's not forget love, <laughs> love, walking in love, which is the greatest uh, command of all. Can you also say that working out your own salvation isn't the fact of being saved and by works you keep your salvation, but it's works that God has done that he's already established. Yes. So you walk by faith so that he is, uh, the word, I guess, established. He's glorified. Yeah. in your life yeah because we have been saved we're being saved and we'll be saved right so, so that there's a process sanctification. Sanctification. yeah sanctification yeah the fruits of that salvation are made more and more evident in our life where yeah it's past present future tense and none of us are in that future tense reality yet but we're moving towards it how do I know we're not in the future where you're not with Christ face to face and that's when we get the absolute fullness of yep. And I've got a, another note, actually, Please. On the, uh, to line up right with what Norbert said. It says, awesome. It's on the God who is at work in you. He says, although the believer is responsible to work, the Lord actually produces the good works and spiritual fruit in the lives of the believer. This is accomplished because he works through us by his indwelling spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. So you and I were still called to be diligent, yep. right? We're still called to seek his face. In fact, I do have another verse, 2 Timothy 2.15. Why don't one of you guys look that up? Again, this is something that you and I are commanded to do. It's kind of like the picture I get is when the Lord gave the different talents, the, the money to the, to the servants, right? And they put it to usury. They put it to work. And the Lord's entrusted to us a certain amount, right? And we put it to work. We can't get any credit for it, really, because even though he does say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because you did, you know, put it into motion. You did, you, you, you put to work what God had given you. Yep, because he had to give it, right? Yeah. In the study this morning, I brought up the idea that a servant only does what the master says. Yes. And that's what a good and faithful servant is. It's someone who doesn't try to do for God what only God can do. Yeah. But you're obedient to what God says and you do what he commands. And the one person that, that was rejected was the one who received the talent, the coin, and he, and he buried it and didn't do anything with it. And that man was even lost, in my opinion. When you read the parable, it would indicate that that person had, was given life from God, which, in my opinion, again, would be the one talent. He didn't put it to, to work, and he lived the life that God gave him without giving any glory to God, and he lost his life. He was taken away. And, or even someone that was given his word that didn't, that didn't do anything with it as well. I yeah. think that's another aspect of that. Yeah, and again, I, I do think there's an aspect with the true believer that there's not a loss of salvation, but a loss of uh, reward, because we are saved by the cross, period. A believer who puts his trust in Christ, you're saved by Christ's finished work. Not by your work, but by his. But now that we are Christian, we want to be, we, we want to see Christ glorified in our life. Not that those works save us, but those works glorify God, and we want to have some kind of a fruits of salvation. Uh, but, you know, the question is, because you put your trust in Christ, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? The answer is yes. If you have genuinely put your trust in Christ, then yes, you would go to heaven, even though you haven't been a perfect Christian. You put your trust in Christ. That's what saves you, right? And uh, yet, since being made a Christian, we want to live in a way that's pleasing to God, and we do want to hear the words, yep. well done, good and faithful. Well, well repentance so, doesn't make you perfect. No. You acknowledge that you're, that you're not. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the, the crux of it. 
And sometimes the, the acts of obedience might be very small. Like I know for me, when I was a brand new believer, he had me go to a church for four years, the first church I went to. And I, I didn't feel like I was doing a whole lot, but the Lord wanted me to go. So I'd go, I'd sit under the, you know, the word, and looking back, it wasn't perfect, but God wanted me to obey. And that four years, what that did for me, it taught me a consistency, to consistently discipline myself to go to church, even though it wasn't, and there's no such thing as a perfect church, but God, that's what God wanted me to do, so I went. And that gave me a discipline of regularly attending a church, which again, I think is a very important part of our Christianity, isn't it? Like we think of the verse, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together is the habit of some, but encourage one another daily as you see the day approaching. And sometimes we're not faithful as we ought to be because we don't realize the importance of what God's calling us to do. It's like, well, I just show up at church. I feel like a bump on a log, so to speak. I just feel like I'm perched there listening. But you have no idea who you might be encouraging just by your presence, just by your smile, just by being there, you know, that you might have that encounter with a person that you have no idea. And, and so, yeah, so we're called to be faithful. And Jesus said, if we're faithful with little, we'll also be faithful with much. But if we're not faithful in the small things, neither will we be faithful in the bigger things. Yes. Yeah. So, the parts of the body don't, don't operate separate yeah. from the body, right? An arm isn't going to function if it's, if it's separated from the body. Yeah, and, and if we're servants, we're not going to be too selective about what we do and don't do, right? We're going to, be, we're going to obey him whether people see it or not. We obey him. So was that 2 Corinthians 2.15 you said? Oh, 2 Timothy 2.15. Yep. Yep. It says, be diligent yep. to present yourself. Now, who's called to be diligent there? We are. We are, amen. To seek. Be diligent to present yourselves approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, but one who rightly divides the word of truth. The problem with reading one on one translation is you kind of mishmash. Yeah. The King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Where the Greek word can infer study, but it also means be diligent. So there is a diligence that you and I are called to do. And sometimes when people distort the message of grace, diligence is taken out. In fact, a true teaching of grace ought to produce real diligence in our life, something that the law could never do. Yep. A true diligence, which is done correctly from the right heart, the right motivation, a diligence that is from faith and love, not from legalism. And so there's a big difference. So you will be far more diligent under, under grace than you would ever be under legalism. You would do more for God, not less. And you'll do it correctly. And uh, our private walk with God is essential too in that aspect. Because if you're in the Word at home, you may rest assured when you come to church, it won't be a trouble for you to get into the Word when we're at church. So, um, instead of like being on the respirator all week long and coming to church and receiving life, you know. <laughs> but... Um, well, we'll close here, guys. Um, thank you for coming tonight. We'll close. Um, Norbert, would you close in prayer? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just come before you with thanksgiving and, Lord, a love for you because you first loved us. And, Lord, none of us can live this life that you've called us to apart from you. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that all of us will be diligent and Help. seek. Amen.